So um, this is going to be a slightly hypothetical case study in the sense that, as Simon indicated, actually our institute isn't up and running yet. We will be open at uh, the end of this uh, calendar year. Nevertheless, uh, I think it's reasonably interesting to give you a sense of what we're trying to achieve, some of the data sources that we're going to be drawing from, uh, and some sort of early indications of how we are working or will work with commercial organisations, because I think it, it will give uh, hopefully some, of, some nuance to the types of questions that might arise. And, and I think one of the key things that will come across is that there are actually very many different ways in which data is going to be collected and will be used and the, there are some sort of differential levels of risk associated to that and that's probably something that should be drawn apart a bit more. So just a word on me, I am a statistical geneticist, actually an evolutionary biologist um, originally. Um, I've spent a lot of the last 10 years working on various programs that are all about trying to measure and understand human genomic variation at large scales and work out what that means for um, our understanding of disease. So that's, that's projects like the Thousand Genomes Project, which I co-led, which was all about just using gene genetic sequencing, genome sequencing, to characterize what human genetic variation looks like to uh, programs like um, the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, which was trying to look at how common genetic variation influences risk for common diseases, through to a program called WGS 500, which was the first, internationally I think, the first um, whole genome sequencing uh, project that was really about trying to uh, bring whole genome sequencing uh, as a tool for broad clinical use into actually into clinical practice and, and was one of the, the, the inspirational motivating uh, projects for the 100,000 Genomes project that we'll hear more about later. So for the last two years I've spent my time trying to uh, get this new institute off the ground, the Big Data Institute, and it's worth saying a bit of, about the motivating force for this uh, institute and, and, and why we think it's an important thing to do. So our starting point is that as we go through life, we leave behind us huge amounts of information. Now, we're, we're sort of fairly used to, if you think about your interaction with the web, people, commercial entities, using that information perhaps actually often without you really knowing that they are, but people using that information to make commercial decisions, trying to target things to you, such as advertisements. So that's one type of information you leave behind. But actually, a much richer and potentially more valuable source of information is all the information you leave behind in your wake around uh, health. Your trajectory through life involves various points of contact with uh, national, local healthcare systems, and at each point of contact there is some information <coughs> recorded. And so by the time you've got hundreds of thousands or millions of individuals with such uh, routine data being collected, perhaps augmented by much deeper views on certain types of data, you can see there's huge potential to mine these data in order to learn about why people get sick and what you can potentially do to intervene. So here are just some of the data sources that, that we, we might be interested in. That's everything from everything uh, from just root, very routine data like hospital records or your GP um, through to things uh, about uh, your environment, so your employment, built environment, the environment in which you live, there might be particular types of data that have been measured on you in really great detail. So it might be sort of imaging data, or ultrasound. There might be pathology records where sort of tissues have been taken at various times. Then there might be things like, what, is the, what has the um, healthcare system done to you? What is it prescribed? What treatments have you been given? Then there are sort of ancillary data that you might collect, such as genetic data, and, and I think that, you know, there's an important and slightly uh, broader uh, 
discussion around genetic data than many of these other data sources. The sharing of genetic data seems to raise a lot more issues in people's minds than sharing many of these other sources. So huge amounts of different types of information collected in many different ways by many different agents, some of them your GP, some of them your hospital, some, some of them even you. And so our starting point for the Big Data Institute is that the future of biomedical research is not going to be totally driven by these sort of ancillary data, but it's going to be a really central feature of how biomedical research works. So that is the collection, integration and analysis of really large population scale data sets that are linking distributed biomedical data, often of many different modalities, by which I mean everything from genome sequences to brain images to electronic medical records. The ability to access, integrate and analyze these data is going to become an essential component of future biomedical research. It's not a nice to have, it will be essential. So that's our starting point and I, I think it's, uh, it's a fairly um, uncontrovertible statement uncontroversial statement. Um, so if we say that this is where we want to end up, then we have to try and work out what are the steps that we need in order to get to that point. So if we want to get there, here, here are some of the things we need. We need people working on new ways, new tools, new devices, new kits for measuring something about health. So if you think of some of the modalities in here, so stuff like genetic data or imaging data or mobile data, which I don't have on here. You know, these are, there's a lot of work in these particular domains about actually how do you collect this information at scale currently going on. But that's focused on, the, on a single modality and the sort of the engineering, the technical challenge of actually analysing that single modality. Then there's really the harder work of trying to collect the population scale cohorts which take these new technologies or existing technologies for measuring biology and link them together along with all the ancillary health information. So uh, I'm not going to go into huge amounts about this but think about the UK Biobank or the Genomics England project as examples of really important programs which are all about linking up data, data sources. Once you've got the data together, that's great, but you then want to try and extract some biology or some meaning from it. And so that isn't a straightforward job. There's huge amounts of correlation, there's huge amounts of structure, huge amounts of noise in the data that you might pull out of this. And so developing robust, powerful, efficient <coughs> statistical and computational techniques for taking such broad data sets and working out what it's telling you about biology requires a, a lot of work. And so I think this is a sort of key thing of what will be going on in, in the Oxford component is it's actually developing the analytical side. But then, of course, there are other components which mustn't be overlooked. Part of it is just to do with how we actually technically go around um, making data accessible to research. So the... So the classic model has been to reach out and identify data that you want, suck it into you, analyse it and publish some results. Actually, there are many, many more things happening in the world where the model of taking an algorithm to a data source, doing some compute over there and then bringing the results back, that is going to be a much more scalable model. And in terms of thinking about individuals' privacy or the ability of local organisations to control what's going on, in, t in terms of how people use their data, that's going to probably become the dominant way in which we have to do analysis. So there's a whole sort of computational environment um, component, which may sound a bit technical, but actually some of the solutions and some of the directions of travel in there I think are really important for thinking about how we um, achieve data sharing. And then finally, and, and of course not least, huge amounts of work to do on the policy side, working with government, public organisations, both nationally and internationally, um, to create the right societal and political um, environment 
in which biomedical big data sharing is um, achievable and um, efficient. So that's the starting point. Um, the Big Data Institute itself is a new building. It's going up on the Churchill site in uh, Oxford. Uh, it's going to look like this. In fact, it already does look like this, except rather than pretty people walking past with bikes, it's just a load of JCBs and things. So uh, it's going to be about 350 um, people, 30 ish groups or so, at the heart of um, what's a very fast growing part of um, Oxford's biomedical uh, scene. We've been made possible by generous donations from the Lee Carl Shing Foundation and the Robertson Foundation. And I mustn't lose any chance to say those names, so I've said them. Um, and I think for us, what's particularly important is that it's a real partnership between a whole bunch of different bits of Oxford. Um, so population health, clinical medicine, tropical medicine, statistics, computer science, engineering, and, 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 and so on. And so when, when I go through some case examples of what we're doing in a second, you'll see names of people from many different places, including bits of Oxford that aren't actually in Oxford. So we're not a new department. We're an analytical hub at the heart of um, the Oxford Biomedical Campus. In terms of what we're doing, um, this is a bit high level, but I'm, I will go through some case studies in a second. So um, I think that there are sort of four key areas in which the Big Data Institute will work. These are to do with how you measure health, collecting data at scale, um, making sense of the data, and, and of course, sharing it appropriately. Just to give a little bit more detail on those, so you understand perhaps what people will be doing a little bit more. On the measurement side, so we're talking about things like omics, genomics, uh, proteomics, metabolomics, you know. So sort of ways of reading what's going on in cells at, at, and, um, yeah, the sub subsequent level at high uh, volume. Uh, peering into individuals through lots of different um, techniques, everything from ultrasound through to fMRI. And then, of course, we, like everyone else, are very interested in what you, what you might potentially learn from <coughs> being able to interact directly or collect data, passive, uh, collect data passively from individuals as they go about their everyday life. So that's on the technology front. Um, on the cohorts and biobanks uh, front, um, I'm going to go into this in a bit more detail in a second, but I think the key point is that there are lots of different ways in which data will be collected. Each will have their own issues around data sent, sharing with the information governments and so on. There will be different expectations and different uh, things that we have to sign up to for, for many different types. So some of the data sources we work with are, um, for example, have through these extremely beautifully structured and um, designed experiments around biobanks, both in the UK and uh, internationally. Some of them are about trying to reach very deeply into clinical data, medical data, around certain uh, domains through working with, particularly with the local NHS. So, you know, trying to what you might be able to get in terms of routine data when you're trying to collect data on half a million people may not be as deep as what you can get if you take a particular data modality and go in very deep. And then, as I said, bits of Oxford that aren't in Oxford, um, there are sort of tropical medicine centres in various parts of the world that we will work um, closely with, because infectious disease is an important component of what, what we're um, trying to work on. On the data sharing side, uh, so the Big Data Institute will have some sort of work as acting as a repository for data, but I think more generally, what we don't think of ourselves as becoming a place where lots of data will come. We're not, we're not like a, an EBI. We're a research institute. We, we want to live and help live in and help build this sort of wider ecosystem around population scale data sharing. So we think um, actually a lot of the work will be around, much more around how you sort of achieve and engineer that wider goal. So developing standards, developing tools for data sharing, so the computational um, structures and so on. So working to build networks of like-minded individuals. And then of course working very hard on how you um, <coughs> make sure that you obtain um, and retain individuals 
uh, engagement in the analysis and um, interpretation of their uh, particular data. And then finally on the analysis side, which is stuff that's perhaps not massively relevant to today, but the sort of things we're talking about are, of course, things like you know, how you peer into high-dimensional data sets and make sense of them, how you combine the different data modalities, and then, of course, how you sort of use what we already know about biology to help interpret what you're seeing in these much bigger data uh, sources. So that's a rather high-level view. I wanted to now sort of drill down into slightly more detail and talk a bit about <coughs> where the data is going to come from. And uh, this is a slide from Martin Landry, who is uh, my uh, deputy, the deputy director in the Institute. And, and he just put together a list of some of the data sets that um, within Oxford there's real sort of leadership on. And I think the, the key point is that as I said, they're very variable. So some of them are prospective cohorts. UK Biobank, other UK programs, perhaps up to two million or so individuals. Sometimes the sort of the long the, the, the length of time over which individuals have been are being watched within these cohorts, you know, years to decades. Similar programs overseas, such as the China Kadori Biobank. But then there are Programs focused much more around specific domains, so clinical trials and different areas, you know, talking about tens of thousands to millions of individuals. And again, a great big span of lengths of time over which they're being collected. And then, so the, the sort of the extreme other end of the spectrum, the sort of routine data sets which are not really about specific individuals so much, but more about the healthcare systems per se, which can cover millions or tens of millions uh, of individuals over many decades. So when we talk about big data, you know, it's not one thing, it's many different things, and it's drawn in different ways, you know, a result, a lot of history, an accident of history, or, um, you know, what was going on 60 years ago that set up the data that we, we now have in our hands. So I just want to go through three uh, quick examples about the types of data that, that we're working with. Um, and my first example is perhaps, I I'd, I'd put this one in because it's kind of not what I imagine people in this room will be expect, expecting. People will be thinking about UK Biobank and you know, programs reaching into um, your primary care data. But actually, if you think about the big data program for, for biomedical research, actually a lot of the information that we want to use is often <coughs> at this really much higher level. The, there are individuals in there, but they're not necessarily in any way identifiable from the data that we end up with. So this is a nice example. This is work led by Peter Geffing, um, uh, it uh, comes out of the Malaria Atlas project, and it's all about trying to map the incidence of malaria and, and actually an increasing number of infectious diseases and, and actually an increasing number of features of them, such as drug resistance. So trying to map where malaria is across the world and how that changes over time so that you can see what effect that intervention programmes are having on the incidence of this disease. Now, typically, the data that Pete uses is, uh, are summaries of expeditions, essentially, that have been led by malaria control programmes within nations who go out and they, they, they're sort of defined protocols for trying to work out how much does, uh, malaria there is in a particular place at a particular time. Those get published in different ways. Um, and so what Pete has been doing for 10 years or so is developing ways of taking in all these different set data sources and trying to work out how good they are, using ecological correlates to try and sort of fill in the gaps a bit and smooth things over. And so end up with things that essentially look like this, which are sort of about 5K resolution um, estimates and they are estimates of um, where malaria is. 
So that's, that's, that's very helpful, but that's not a fully scalable uh, program. You know, these, these malaria control programs, there aren't equivalent control programs for every disease, and they don't often, you know, they, they may go to this place this year and a different place the next year. So you end up with very patchy data. So what Pete's been pursuing is the idea of using big data sources such as news media um, in trying to um, make better, better scaled estimates but also a t better resolution on the temporal scale. Um, and to do this, of course, you know, these data sources are very variable. Some are high quality, some are poor quality. Um, and so they've developed this whole system for trying to learn the quality and integrity of different sources, how that changes over time. They're also using um, various individuals to, to collect data. And again, they're trying to learn how reliable these different individuals are. So the idea is you, you, you essentially have a system that can suck in data of many different scales, many, diff many different levels of veracity, and integrate that to, to essentially come up with a map that looks like this. So it's, there we are, as I said, individuals in this, but typically one isn't looking actually at those um, individual level data. So the next level down is, a, is, of course, trying to get more towards the individual and trying to get closer to a population view of health by measuring the fate and what happens in uh, a large number of, of actual participants. Just to take an example, um, what, this is work led by Aidan Doherty, who's at NDPH and IBME, and he's interested in measuring human activity using um, accelerometer data. And he's been also, he's also part of the working group, which is, uh, has been leading to collect um, 100,000, data on 100,000 individuals in the UK by a bank on precisely uh, this sort of information. So when you're faced with this kind of problem, you want to measure human activity, it's of course easy to stick something like this on an individual. In fact, you're, almost all of you are walking around with an equivalent device in your pocket. Um, so it's easy to, it's kind of easy to collect data and it's easy to obtain traces that look like this. But of course, what we care about is um, extracting information from this. We care about trying to take these signals and work out what it actually means for individuals. And so in addition to the sort of very large scale, relatively unannotated data that you might be able to collect on a very large number of individuals. Aidan also has been working to collect much deeper information on a much, much more limited set of individuals. So for example, in this case, where there's data being collected through something that looks like this, but there's all, these people are also wearing cameras around their necks, so you could, they're essentially taking a video of, of their their day, and they're also self-annotating what's going on, it, on there. So that's the, the point is you've got some individuals where you've got great depth, and then you've got some studies where you've got the great breadth. And again, there are different sort of levels of privacy or contract that's required with the participants uh, to obviously achieve this degree of data sharing on the part of the individual but also it has different sure, consequences for how you might go about sharing these kinds of data with other uh, individuals. The final example I, I wanted to go through is um, work by Chris um, Nelica, who's in the audience and will take part in the discussions tomorrow, who's at the end of the IBME. And his work is kind of at the, if you've got this sort of collection of barely individual level data in the malaria case. This is at the complete <coughs> opposite end of the spectrum. This is working with individuals who are uploading their own or data or data uh, on their children. So Chris's uh, work is all about using um, photos initially and then uh, moving on to video later um, of children who have a suspected uh, disorder so trying to use photo 
information uh, combined with computer vision to improve the way in which diagnosis happens. Now, initially, this is um, the work has focused just on the um, taking the images and looking at them directly and sort of clustering them in different levels. Uh, but the path and the, the program of research that Chris is pursuing is all about, of course, including other data modalities such as um, genetics. So what is shown so far is that if you take images off the web um, and you cope with the various complexities that arise out of using you know, incredibly noisy or big data sort of sources of information, you can nonetheless cluster, um, you can find really strong clustering of facial features that are extracted using automated approaches from such uh, data. That you, so you get um, clustering, and this clustering is uh, also carries over into data sources and, dis and disorders, which are not in the original training set. So this is this is nice, this sort of proof of concept, and then what Chris is doing is taking this further to actually uh, enable individuals to upload their own data, or as I said, that uh, carers to upload data of their um, their children's, so that they can provide a much richer source of information about, um, obviously, a whole series of photographs, but also ancillary um, data. So there, I think, you've seen a, a sort of a full spectrum of the type of data that we will be using within the Big Data Institute. So when it comes to thinking about um, interactions with commercial organisations, which is obviously what we're here to talk about, it, it's, it's clear that I mean, when I think, when I sort of come across that question, it, it's really not one thing. There are many different ways in which we'll interact with commercial organisations, and they have different flavours around them. So some are very straightforward. Some are just around, you know, commercial organisations as vendors. We we'll, we'll need stuff like IT hardware, data infrastructure to make our lives um, easy, and so that that's a sort of a sort of win-win relationship. But then there are, there are slightly more sort of embedded relationships. There are ones where we, we sort of are working with commercial organisations, either in a pre-competitive way or as in a sort, of, um, a sort of a shared risk way, where we're, for example, um, there are fellows that we're supporting that are co-sponsored by commercial organisations, there's bits of research that we might individually undertake uh, as PIs uh, are in collaboration with commercial organisations. So that's sort of cases where um, commercial organisations want some bit of work to be done. Typically, they see it as pre-competitive and where they think the, the, the best way of making that happen is through sponsoring some academic research. But then there are sort of getting even slightly more in bed with commercial organisations, it's the role as collaborators. And I've had a, a long history myself of working with commercial organisations um, to drive things like technology development or to sort of make projects like the 1000 Genomes Project or the WGS 500 programme actually work, you know, without the full engagement of, com of commercial organisations, <coughs> typically in kind, so they're not, this isn't through funding, this is through providing their expertise, possibly some of the technology, such as the genome sequencing, um, possibly algorithms, you know, a whole, huge variety of things. Many ways in which science has actually benefited hugely through the um, engagement of uh, academics and um, commercial organisations. And then um, the final way in which I think we'll interact with commercial organisations, which we mustn't forget, is as clients. So, for example, a lot of people within Oxford University act as consultants to one or more commercial organisations. A lot of people, including myself, have spin-out companies. So the company I and co-founder of, is all about trying to bring together all the publicly generated data sets linking genomic variation to health in many different ways, and using that to learn about 
underlying biology, and then work with pharmaceutical organisations or um, diagnostic companies to improve the way in which either the drug development or the individual diagnosis uh, process actually works. So I am a user of the, of the results of the data, and I have a commercial interest myself. So I think that's another important nuance is that it's not really a them and us. There's many instances in which them and us are actually the same people. So in terms of um, what we were asked to do, I, I had a, a sort of list of things that I was meant to try and address from Mark. I, here's just a sort of a summary of where I think um, some of the key things that we, we need to, to, to think about. So the first is, of course, I, and I'm sure most of the people in this room, if not everyone, uh, am a great believer in the power of population scale data collection and analysis as a way of driving insight about biological mechanism and opportunities for intervention in, in human disease. I think I could point to hundreds of examples where that's paid off. We see that as an increasingly important trend in biomedical research and in order to sort of achieve the goal that we all want to end up with, there are all sorts of things that we need to achieve. We need access to the relevant data. We need the ongoing consent. I've used the word consent there, although I, I heard so someone earlier said permission is a better word, and I, I agree. I think that seems like a, a, a better word to use. So the ongoing permission and trust of participants. On the technical side, uh, and as a statistician, you know, I care a lot about sort of the technical details. Actual expertise in the technical side, the storage, dissemination, analysis is really important. Because without trust around, are you going to keep the data okay? Are you going to share it with the right people? And are you going to make sensible insights from it? You know, the program of sort of benefiting the wider uh, society and making sure that you meet privacy and so on will fall over. And then finally, I think uh, it's pretty obvious that um, if you're going to have a long-term program around this, you need real and also perceived value to individuals and wider society arising from the set. And the perceived isn't meant to be things that are false, but it's, you, can't have, you can have real value that has no wider perception. Um, the point is that where advances are made, they need to be communicated back to uh, individuals. Um, so in terms of the interaction with commercial organisations, I think the, the, the starting point has to be that, to a large extent, the drivers of the long-term drivers of commercial and not-for-profit stakeholders are largely aligned. We both want new therapies or better use of existing therapies. Okay, it might be that they want to sell therapies and to sell more of the therapies they actually have, if you're, if you're talking about drug companies. But actually, we both ultimately want the same thing. But of course, there are situations where that breaks down, typically when there are short-term instruments that uh, are not well aligned to the longer-term goals. And so I mean things like inappropriate financial models, issues such as whether you can get financial gain from selling access to, to data, particular data assets, or where commercial organisations try and assume some kind of ownership of fundamental or individual level data. So typically, I, I think many of the negative cases that, that you can point at arise because the sort of, there's an instrument in there which, which goes against the longer term um, driver. There's one thing I think that would, I would kind of put out as, a, um, as an additional and perhaps slightly different category, which is typically the types of research I've been talking about, what we're interested in is not the individual. And I think that's sort of a key feature of population uh, research. As a researcher, I don't care, actually, about an individual. It seems like a rather harsh thing to say. 
But what I care about is the patterns that I can see by putting lots of individuals together. And so what I care about are the results of applying my research to these large collections of data. And I think where interactions with commercial organisations tend to work is whether they are also keen to see the results of the research. The alternative is, of course, that commercial organisations could not actually be interested in the results, but more the individual itself. And that's, for example, where the insurer part um, is an issue because they're, not, they're interested in an individual's data not so much because... Um, of what they can learn about general patterns, but for what they can say about the individual themselves. And so I think it's a harsh point, but I think finishing on saying that um, population, uh, population, biomedical population data users are um, clearly ultimately reliant on the data from many, many individuals, but typically the whole point is that they're trying to see um, the wood rather than the trees. And with that, I'll shut up. Thanks. <laughs>